In today's A-level IB biology video, we're going to be looking at semi-conservative replication of DNA. So remember that DNA is that molecule, looks a little bit like a ladder, and it's made up of what's called nucleotides, which contain a sugar, which remember in the case of DNA is deoxyribose, a base, which will either be adenine, guanine, cytosine, or thymine. And remember the base pairing rules mean that the straight letters bind together and the curly letters bind together, similar to this. And finally, a phosphate. And it's the sugar and the phosphate which form this backbone along here, so they'll alternate down here. And the rungs of the ladder are where you find your bases. So if this was an A, it would be bound to a T. If this was a C, it would be bound to a G, and so on and so forth. So that's how you form your DNA. And remember, it is a double helix, which basically means that it wraps around itself a little bit like a roller coaster. But we've talked previously in a video about how we need to copy that DNA in order to produce new cells so that we can grow and repair. And how is that new DNA produced? Well, it's through semi-conservative replication. And just to give you a brief summary of what that phrase actually means, it means that when you produce your new DNA molecules, your new DNA molecules will contain one strand of the old DNA molecule. So if one DNA strand was to separate, such as this one, to become two single strands, one would appear in each of the new molecules. So we're going to go into greater detail now as to how we actually carry out semi-conservative replication. And first of all, we'll start by listing all the various things you need in order for it to take place. And I'm going to call this requirements for semi-conservative replication of DNA. So first of all, you need four bases present, which I've already mentioned is adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. You need an enzyme, which we are going to cause DNA polymerase. We'll talk about its role shortly. And you need a source of energy in order to drive the process. So I've started by drawing very simply a DNA double helix. So we have our two supports of the ladder and they are joined together by the rungs which we know we find the bases and we can see here that they are obeying base pairing rules which means that G and C always bond with hydrogen bonds and T and A always bond. So in order to replicate this DNA first of all we have to separate the two strands and the enzyme we use to do this is called DNA helicase. So what does this actually look like? Well, we'll use the same DNA so that we don't get confused. Now just remember that these hydrogen bonds are found here. So there's two between every thymine and adenine and three between guanine and cytosine. So I'm just drawing these in here. And what that DNA helicase does is it causes these bonds to break. So as you can see in the second diagram, we've got separation of the two strands now that separation has occurred, there will be free nucleotides present in the nucleus which are activated and they can come and bind now to their complementary bases. And now because we have exposed bases, we know those nucleotides can come and bind. So adenine would obviously bind to thymine. Thymine would bond to adenine, cytosine would bond to guanine, and guanine would bind to cytosine. So hopefully you can see that here we've got two mini DNA strands forming. Now, just to add a further detail, so I said that these three nucleotides pair up with the exposed bases. Now, in order to attach properly to form bonds, we need a second enzyme, which I've already mentioned, which is DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase joins the free nucleotides 
with the unpaired DNA bases. And here a special type of bond is used, which is the phosphodiester bond. And so if we look at the finished product, so I've drawn out the two new DNA strands which would be formed. As you can see, they are identical to the original strand. And because each of these DNA mo molecules retains half of the original DNA, so the DNA from the original molecule, this is why we call this method a semi-conservative method. So two identical molecules of DNA are formed. Each new molecule retains half of the original DNA material, hence why this is known as semi-conservative replication. We'll look at some past paper practice now. So describe the role of DNA polymerase in DNA replication. And remember that I taught you that DNA polymerase's role is to bring along the free nucleotides in the nucleus in order to produce the sugar phosphate backbone. Other than being smaller, give two ways in which prokaryotic DNA is different to eukaryotic DNA. Remember that with prokaryotic DNA, we're looking at bacterial DNA, and remember some of this DNA is found in nucleoids, and some is found in the form of circular strands called plasmids. This does not exist in eukaryotic DNA. And the other thing with prokaryotic DNA is there's no non-coding DNA. In fact, there's only exons present. The table shows the percentage of each base in the DNA from three different organisms. So we're comparing the amount of adenine, guanine, thymine and cytosine in humans, grasshoppers and a virus. Humans and grasshoppers have very similar percentages of each base in their DNA, but they are very different organisms. Use your knowledge of DNA structure and function to explain how this is possible. Now remember that the physical characteristics are given by genes, because remember a section of DNA codes for a particular protein. So although they have a similar percentage of each base, they have different genes, which means that different amino acids and proteins are coded for. The DNA of the virus is different from that of other organisms. Use the table above and your knowledge of DNA to suggest what this difference is and explain your answer for two marks. Remember that the base pairing is as follows, A to T and C to G, which makes sense because you have the same approximate amounts of adenine and thymine in the human and the same with the grasshopper. However, with the virus, the adenine and the thymine amounts are not the same. And the same is true for guanine and cytosine, so they can't be pairing up in the same way. And this indicates, therefore, that we don't have our typical DNA double strand. In fact, it's single. So adenine and thymine and cytosine and guanine are not found in equal amounts in the virus, indicating that base pairing cannot occur. DNA is therefore single-stranded. Question three. Figure one shows one base pair of a DNA molecule. Name parts F of each nucleotide. 
So this is a 5-carbon sugar, and remember DNA stands for deoxyribose. Sugars always end in O's, so it's deoxyribose sugar. Scientists determined that a sample of DNA contained 18% adenine. What are the percentages of thymine and guanine in this sample of DNA? Oh, this is like a puzzle. So we know that adenine always binds to thymine. So if 18% of it is adenine, we know that they must be equal in order for them to correctly base pair. So 18% of thymine must exist. And then we know that adenine, thymine, cytosine and guanine make up 100% of the DNA. There are no other bases. So how do we make that add up to 100? Well, you can add together 18 plus 18 to get 36. Take that away from 100 so we know what percentage is made up of cytosine and guanine, which is 64, and therefore divide that by 2 so we know that it's 32% of each. During replication, the two strands of a DNA molecule separate and each acts as a template for the production of a new strand. Figure 2 represents DNA replication. Name the enzyme shown in figure 2. Now, this is the enzyme responsible for assembling those three nucleotides together. So it's DNA polymerase. The arrows in figure 2 show the directions in which each DNA strand is being produced. Use figure 1 and figure 2 in your knowledge of enzyme action to explain why the arrows point in opposite directions. So we can see from figure 1 that the DNA is running as two parallel strands running against each other. So we say that they are anti-parallel. We can also see from figure 1 that the nucleotides are aligned in a different order. Now because DNA polymerase being an ase is an enzyme, it means that it has a very specific active site which binds to this substrate. So they can only bind in a very specific way. So from figure 1 we can see that DNA has anti-parallel strands, so strands that run in the opposite direction to each other. And we can also see that the shape of the nucleotides is different. Now, because DNA polymerase is an enzyme, has a very specific active site. which can only bind to substrates of a specific complementary shape.